This is attorney Andy Markintel and attorney Mark J. Victor. We are the attorneys for freedom, and you, my friends, are listening to the Peace Radicals podcast. How's it going today, Mark? Going great, man. Always excited to do another uh, episode of Peace Radicals and uh, get to another interesting guest. And uh, yeah, always, you know, just happy to be alive, man. It's a good happy day to, to be, be alive. alive and on the planet, kicking around. No and doubt, man. We should be thankful for that every day. We have our health, and uh, we live in a pretty good place in the planet, all things considered. So it's another day to be thankful for just being here. Yeah. We should never lose perspective on that point. Now, for we're, sure. we're promoting something called the Live and Let Live movement, and maybe you're just clicking on this video for the first time. You don't know what it's all about. Mark, you want to give the uh, elevator pitch for the... Um for the Live and Let Live movement. Yeah, yeah, the Live and Let Live movement, we boldly assert that we are the world's only real peace movement. Um, I, actually, I'm not even sure there's another peace movement right now at all going on, but the reason we can claim to be the world's only real peace movement is because we're the only one, at least best as best we can tell, that actually has a principle that is anti-aggression, and so in other words, we are simply put against aggression. We think that if a person aggresses against another person, we would say they violate the live and let live rule, but we would say aggression should always be illegal. So if you don't take that position, I don't know how you could possibly be for peace or even for freedom. And so I think we are the only global peace movement that takes that position. So live and let live is as it sounds, uh, as it purports to be live and let live. We think this is a very important, maybe the most fundamentally important principle that should govern how humans interact with each other. And uh, we can actually derive two different principles from live and let live. One, there's a legal principle. The other, there's an ethical principle. It's important to make a distinction between the two because legality and ethics are radically different. I think a lot of people get confused about this, and this is a really important point to understand if you're interested in freedom and peace. And so what we're saying is that the legal world ought to be calibrated around what we call the live and let live legal principle. Simply put, don't be an aggressor. What's an aggressor? Well, somebody who initiates force against another person or their property, someone who engages in fraud, someone who engages in coercion, or somebody who does something that puts another person or their property at a grave risk of harm. They are endangering another person. And so what we're saying is that the law ought to always prohibit anything that falls in that category. And in a lot of respects, it does right now. I mean, if you think about murder, rape, robbery, burglary, these are all violations of that legal principle. But there sure are a lot of laws that are currently on the books that aren't well calibrated to the live and let live principle. No question about that. And so what we're saying here is that all laws ought to apply to all people and all groups and should prohibit all acts that violate that principle. So we proudly say that we are post-racial in the live and let live movement. We don't care about what color your skin is or where you were born or what foods you eat or, or who you love or any of that. That's your business. The live and let live principle applies to everyone equally, rich, poor, fat, thin, whatever. And also, and this seems like an obvious point, but a lot of people miss this, it also applies even if people form groups. So if you and I form a group, we still don't get to violate the live and let live principle. And even if the groups are really big, like a corporation. So what we're saying is the law should prohibit all groups, including corporations, from violating the live and let live legal principle. This also applies to the biggest group of all, the government. So the government shouldn't do anything that initiates force or fraud or coercion against another person or do anything that puts us in a risk of harm. So that's what the legal principle is about. Then there's the ethical principle. And the reason law is different than ethics is because, look, you can violate an ethics rule. And uh, while your mom might be upset with you and your friends, you may lose friends and people might not want to do business with you. There's no formal consequences. We're not going to put you in jail or a fine or probation because you violated an ethics rule. And this is really important. So what we're saying is that if you do something that is not in a violation of the legal principle, you should be left alone, even if other people determine what you did was immoral or unwise or unhealthy or something like that. You are left to your own devices here. That's what freedom and peace are about. But we have something to say in this area. Unlike other freedom movements that basically stop there, we are promoting what we call aspirational values. And you might sum them up with the phrase, just be a good human. 
Be a good human. Now, look, n- nobody's perfect, right? I mean, we're all imperfect humans acting imperfectly, but we want people to aspire to act better, right? Bring out the best version of yourself. What are we talking about here in this space? Things like being open minded towards other people, being tolerant towards how other people live. If they don't violate the legal principle, leave them alone. Voluntary kindness towards other human beings and civility. Even if we disagree, we should do it in an agreeable type of a way. And then building high levels of trust with other human beings, super important for relationships, being committed to facts and the truth and rational thought. And we do this stuff because our goals here in this space are to optimize human happiness while decreasing human suffering. But to be clear about it, you got every right to act in an intolerant, a closed-minded, uncivilized way without any interference from anyone else. So long as you don't violate the live and let live legal principle, you should be left alone. But this kind of a person is really not a good candidate for the live and let live movement, even though we'd be the ones championing their ability to act in these sort of crazy, immoral, unethical kind of ways. So hopefully that puts a little overview on what live and let live is about and i would just add to that it's a global movement and we have chapters all over the world right now at least 10 different countries in africa lots of different countries in europe canada australia and many chapters throughout the united states and uh, the live and let live movement is going to officially kick off in march of 2023 so if you're listening to this This is my plea for you to get involved and be part of the solution. All right. Good summary there. And if you want to learn a lot more about this movement, go to liveandletlive.org and you'll get a ton of info. Let's get our guest on the line here. Today we're talking to Danilo Cuellar. And he is a freedom activist. He actually is a jack of many trades. I was just reading his uh, biography. And uh, I guess I'll just let him talk about himself. Danilo, how you doing today, man? Hey, how you guys doing? Uh, great to be on the show. Thank you for the uh, for the invitation. Uh, I have heard a lot about you guys, and um, you know when Mark was talking about the uh, the idea of live and let live, it kind of reminds me of uh, you know there's many different um, synonyms for this, like the golden rule, you know, treat others the way you want to be treated, that kind of thing. And um, I was actually talking. I was in a co-op recently in a homeschool co-op with my kids, and I was actually because I I have discussions with the other homeschooling kids about things like related to the Tuttle Twins books. So are you guys familiar with Connor Boyack, the yep. Tuttle, Tuttle Twins? Yeah. yeah, he's great. I have all his books and everything. So one of them, it deals with the golden rule, right? So so we discuss the golden rule. And basically, in the way I discuss it, I try to make these kind of like um, understandable and approachable to kids. And so one way I, I did that was I said, when you, know, you and your siblings get into a fight um, and, and then you know one of them starts crying, and then the parent comes over. What's the first thing the parent says, uh, which is usually who started it, right? That is the most important thing, right? As, as what Mark just said, who was the aggressor? Who initiated the violence, right? So that is so clear. And, you know, the idea is that self-defense is justifiable in, in the uh, situation of an aggressor. Uh, but being the aggressor is not justifiable. So, yeah, very, very important um, principle. And yeah, I talk about it a lot with, with the homeschooling kids, because, you know, if we can get kids to understand this stuff, how much better of a world will this be? Right. And, you know, and, and that's why I love the, the, uh, title name of your podcast, peace radicals, right? Because <laughs> how, for number one, how can peace be radical? I right, think that's the right. first thing. And another thing that, that me and my wife, that we really pursued when we had children, we, we agreed on this was the idea of peaceful parenting. Right. How you raise your kids in a way so that they understand morality and and they understand, you know, the consequences of their actions. And so you not using violence to teach them uh, rules, which I would argue they never learn anything when you're violent towards your kids. All they learn is that, oh, my parents use violence to solve their problems. So maybe I should use violence to solve my problems. Right. I think that's the only that's one of the only lessons that kids acquire when parents, um, you know, use corporal punishment with their kids. So, so very, very important to raise your kids um, to understand these principles, because uh, um, I think that's one of the best ways we can, uh, 
yeah, create a peaceful world. Yeah, we sure do in, uh, appreciate the focus on good parenting there. We talk about this all of the time in this movement. It's definitely the number one way that we can ensure that the next generation is good, is that a, fo- a focus on good parenting. Mark and I can tell you as criminal defense attorneys, many, many, many of our clients uh, who uh, commit criminal acts or who end up in bad p- places in their life, you can pretty much usually trace it back to the parenting. And so that's why what you're talking about is so important. And, you know, we, we understand, too, you, uh, you know, have, have this activism towards homeschooling. Just for, for uh, our listeners who may not be familiar with you, Daniil, can you kind of give us a little bit about your background, interests, the types of things you're into? As I mentioned, you've got quite a resume. Yeah, and promote your podcast as well. Sure, sure. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, all right. So, my background. So, um, I'm a, right now, I'm a chess coach. Um, I'm a piano teacher. I'm also an acupuncturist, Chinese herbalist, um, Eastern nutritionist, massage therapist. By, that's my profession. Uh, chess coaching, obviously. I didn't study that in college. I taught myself as a teenager. And amazingly enough, uh, this whole uh, lockdown fiasco that occurred in 2020 uh, has actually boosted me as a chess coach because you know you can imagine all these people at home like sitting at home what what should i do <laughs> so many people took up chess especially online chess lessons and so uh, i work for another chess company and also work for myself and and hosting group classes and yeah we all got a boost a lot of business a lot of people interested in chess so uh that's pretty amazing um yeah and and the piano i i, I have a great passion in piano as well so uh, i i don't have that many piano students i do teach my kids piano as part of the homeschooling, um, as well as chess as part of the home, our homeschooling curriculum. Um, and yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, other things I've done, I, I used to do stand-up comedy. <laughs> I don't know if that's, is that on my resume? I don't know. It I, was, I, yeah. I okay, okay. Yeah, I did stand-up comedy for about a year uh, when my uh, my wife was pregnant with our, our second child that was in like in 2011. And uh, yeah, I started it with my brother 10 years younger. And we went, uh, we, we took a comedy class, seven week comedy class in Long Island. And it was taught by professional comedians. And um, at the end, they, uh, you know, you have a performance, you know, graduation performance. And then, you know, some people continue. I continued. I was performing in uh, clubs in Long Island. And then I moved to Manhattan clubs, which were awesome. Um, and I did it for a year. I performed probably around 40 times. A lot of fun, met a lot of amazing people. Um, you know, funny, uh, I remember a poll, which was, um, you know, they're asking a bunch of people, what are you most afraid of? Right. And um, number one is um, public speaking. Mm-hmm. And number two is death. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that. <laughs> so it's pretty amazing. The, uh, the deep seated fear that most people have for standing in front of a group of, uh, you know, strangers, basically people you don't know. And just talking, right? And stand-up comedy is one of those things where, like, there's no props. You know, you're not acting. You can't rely on anything. You just, it's just you and a microphone. And you like make these people laugh. They don't know who you are, you know. And and it really, uh, I think, it teaches a lot about yourself. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've learned a great deal, and I think that's very useful in so many ways. You know, just how do you? make people feel relaxed around it doesn't matter you know what your message is actually you know if you can just relax people and 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 make them laugh like within the first couple of minutes of meeting someone it's infinitely more likely they're they're, they're actually going to listen to what you have to say and take what you say seriously right so you can you know you can be really educated you know nobel lawyer write books and everything but if people don't feel relaxed around you if they don't feel comfortable then odds are they're not going to actually um, understand or, or want to listen to what you have to say. <laughs> so humor, uh, one of my favorite quotes, I think uh, Oscar Wilde, he says, if you want to tell people the truth, make them laugh or, or they'll kill you. <laughs> <laughs> so I live, I really do live by that principle. Uh, like when I meet somebody new, it's like I'm, I'm trying to crack a smile as quick as possible. <laughs> That's my goal. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, so I did that. And then also, so now, and then I started my uh, peacefinarchism.com website and podcast in back in like 2013, 2014. And yeah, it, it used to be just me uh, doing solo podcast episodes, like um, half hour episodes. And then it slowly morphed into me interviewing people. And I, I probably have interviewed around 150 people on various topics. 
um, you know, ranging from Bitcoin, anarchism, homeschooling, unschooling, um, cryptocurrency, central banking, Federal Reserve, you know, amazing entrepreneurs. Um, you know, I, I interviewed Dale Brown, who, the, who runs the Detroit Threat Management um, Center. I don't know if you know about him in Vipers Threat Management. He's an amazing guy, like like private alternative, um, how, how would you say, security uh, agency, um, you know. And yeah, I mean, I mean, just so many people. It's just just amazing. And, and a bunch of homeschoolers and unschoolers, because me being a, a homeschooler, a lot of people who are not familiar with homeschooling, they say, are you the only one? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I don't know any homeschoolers. Right. And so I'm in a unique position where I can say, well, actually, I interviewed a bunch of them. Here's a bunch of of interviews of how they've done it. And everybody does it differently, of course. Right. Which is amazing and great because kids are like you know so unique and diverse you know uh, government school is like a one size fits all solution to a very um uh variegated problem mm -hmm. right so so the idea is what you know how could we get a child to learn and be passionate about learning uh, and and government school definitely does not cater to the individual they can't cater to the individual at all uh, so I think homeschool and unschool is just just awesome for that. Well, I think uh, I think most people are at least familiar with the concept of homeschooling, but what is unschooling for people who may not know what that? Yeah. Is? So so um, okay. So homeschooling, the way I describe it is like uh, the most strictest form of homeschooling would be basically what what most people did during the lockdown, which is they took exactly what they were doing in government school and they just did it at home, like very strict you know, uh, course structure. Right. Uh, and then you have, um, people who do, then, then they depart from that. Some people do like uh, religious, uh, curriculum. Some people, you know, do, uh, focus on workbooks. Some people do, uh, online resources. Um, I mean, we do a bunch, like we do all that online. We do workbooks. We do, um, I do the chess teaching and I, you know, we, my kids subscribe to various chess websites. So I, I use that and then piano and then they also have in-person classes, you know, fencing and ballet and tap and gymnastics and all this kind of stuff. So, yeah, so we use a lot. And then the unschooling is like complete unstructured, which is a is a, is an interesting philosophy. It's like uh, and, and I interviewed actually the woman who uh, is considered like the champion of, uh, of unschooling, which her name is Dana Martin. I'm sure, Mark, you're familiar with her. She, no. she was at she was at uh, not. OK, so she went to an Pulco a bunch of times. And she's, I think she's run workshops there for Jeff. Uh, and yeah, and she's amazing. Like she has, I think she has four kids and uh, they're all unschooled. So basically it's complete unstructured. So basically there's no curriculum whatsoever. And the kids completely direct what they want to learn, you know, when they want to learn it. Right. This sounds somewhat and, familiar to the Montessori concept of more of a self-directed. Uh, I would student. say much more unstructured than that. Much, yeah, so much less structured than that. And and when when you tell that to most parents who are just familiar with the government school model, they get like they get like frightened because they're like, oh my goodness, if I don't force my kid to learn something, uh, you know, every day, he's not going to learn anything. He's just going to go and watch TV or play video games. Like he's not going to be. He's going to be completely unmotivated, right? And so the idea is. Uh, First of all, a kid that is in a government school model, one of the unwritten rules, there's many unwritten rules to that, but one of them is my free time is not my own, right? And so they quickly understand that they're there most of the time, not because they want to be there because they have to be there. And then they quickly understand that they have no choice in what they're actually learning, right? So it's like, it's complete force. Talking about aggression and force, being in a government school situation is, is aggression all the time, complete force. Um, you know, they say unwanted, um, you know, sexual contact is rape. Well, what's unwanted educational content, right? <laughs> so some people say that's rape of the mind, right? So analogous. So so basically their their understanding is that they have no choice. So then when they get home um, on the weekends or even, let's say, during the summer vacation or during a, like a one week break, do you think that they would want to pick up a book and read during that during those times <laughs> or would they want to completely shut off? and get as far away from anything educational as possible. Because in their mind, education is equivalent to force. Mm. That's, that's, that's the association they've made. And so they want to get as far away from that as possible. And so the parent sees that and they're like, oh, look at that. So obviously, if the kid does not force to learn, he's just going to lounge around and do nothing, right? Uh, whereas um, you look at a homeschooled child, uh, completely homeschooled, let's say from the very beginning, like my kids are. My kids never been to any... Uh, daycare, um, preschool, kindergarten, nothing, never been to anything. Um, and so those children, they do understand that they, their 
their free time is their own, right? I mean, we do some basic stuff, writing, reading, math, you know, that kind of thing. But that that doesn't take up eight hours of our day. Maybe it takes up an hour, like like very little, right? So for the most part, they are pretty much free to choose and learn what they want. And guess what? Kids want to learn. They, they're they curious. Like, like uh, I forget, was it um, Mark Twain? He said, um, curiosity. City is uh, is nature's first education, right? So kids do want to learn, right? And the idea with with homeschool and unschool, and the way I approach it, is that it doesn't really matter what you teach your kids, right? That's not the focus or the goal. That that doesn't matter at all in the slightest, right? What matters is that you inspire a flame of curiosity for learning in your child, and if you do that, it doesn't matter what they do in life, they'll be a success. Right. Why? Because if a person has self-motivation, if they have drive to excel, then you can put them in any situation and they'll excel. Right. They will learn what they need. Like, like, you know, what do you when you talk to successful entrepreneurs? What's the what, what's the the uh, the most common advice? It's not go to college and get a business degree. <laughs> you know, the most common advice that I see is why don't you apprentice under someone uh, that you want to emulate? And you learn on the job, <laughs> right? That that I think is one of the most valuable things. So so you learn directly the skills that are are relevant to you and valuable to you, right? And so I would assert that when a child has curiosity and interest in their life, that you you find that what that is, you recognize it and you nurture it, right? You feed it, you give them information. It doesn't matter what it is, it could be like you know, space travel could be like history, dinosaur, whatever. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You don't know where that fire, uh, you know, where that um, that path will lead to in the future because none of us <laughs> know the future. But all we know is this kid really loves, you know, space travel. So what happens if he if he dives into that head, you know, head first and you give him books and you show him videos and and uh, and articles all about it and maybe take classes taught by astronauts or whatever. Where is that going to lead? I don't know. But most likely that information will be relevant to his or her future because he's interested in it now. And most likely those kind of people will develop a business. In a nutshell, to me, it sounds like what you're trying to do as opposed to something like imposing a lesson plan or something like that in a public school. You're trying to get the the child, the student, to associate learning with freedom. You're trying to get the child to associate creativity with freedom rather than coercion, right? Because yeah. there are obvious detriments to a child associating learning in school with coercion, <laughs> namely that they're going to try to avoid it in every waking moment of their free time that they can, right, and try to escape from it. So it sounds like a positive reinforcement strategy. But for, for a lot of people... This type of education and this type of a program is a, just a completely foreign thing. So let's focus in just a little bit to help kind of paint a picture. In an unschooling type of environment, we have a, we have a, a child who's staying at home. Uh, the parents are acting as, I guess, counselors or um, teachers, and we're in an unschooling environment. What does a typical day look like in an unschooling environment? What's the role of the parent as teacher? What resources are made available and so on? What does it look like? So, yeah, here's the other thing. Here's the other um, common um, fear that I get when I talk to parents who are unfamiliar with homeschooling or unschooling. They say, um, I'm not a teacher. I wasn't trained as a teacher. Right. I'm not a mathematician. How can I teach my kids math? You know, and my response is, do you have to be a NASCAR driver to teach your kid how to drive a car? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have to be an iron chef to teach a kid how to cook basic meals? <laughs> you know, we don't have to be masters in our in, in everything in order to teach our kids something. Right. We all have uh, have skills that we have acquired that are valuable and that we can impart to our kids and that they will find uh, use for. Right. So so it's it's a self-defeating argument to say that I'm not an expert in everything. Therefore, I can't teach my child. Right. So, yeah. So basically, um, you know, number one, the, the, another thing that the another thing that the kids uh, get a, a great um, advantage of homeschooling is that you don't have to wake up what six in the morning uh, or seven in the morning. And what is the most important thing for kids is sleep. Right. They are growing. Their bodies are immature. They're they're They need sleep. Right. That is so valuable. So for 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 kids to wake up early 
unnaturally. You know, if they wake up early naturally, it's one thing. But if they don't, you know, to interrupt the child's sleep is so uh, detrimental to their health and to their growth, right? So that's the first thing. Homeschool kids, my kids anyway, they, we don't really have a wake up time. <laughs> the kids do wake up eight o'clock, nine o'clock, sometimes 10 o'clock. I mean, we try not to, but but um, but yeah, so and, and you know, we get home late because we do a lot of driving. Here's the other thing about homeschooling is you're going to do a lot of driving. Um, and, you know, pro I, I would say the um, the general rule of thumb is if something is over an hour drive away. OK, that might be too far, <laughs> but up to an hour, it should be fine. So get used to driving. That's very important because you want to you want to meet up with other families, you know, homeschooling co-ops. You want to do all these classes. So driving is very important. Um, but yeah, so we wake up. And the kids do some some work. My, my son is into electrical engineering. Sometimes he works on some some of his projects. Um, you know, he follows this this engineer on uh, on YouTube, and we actually did an online course where he was showing the people. They're, they're, and then this is not just for kids. This is for adults also. So he's showing people how to create, how to come up with an idea, create a blueprint, create a prototype, and then build it. Right. And this is mechanical engineering. This is electrical engineering. So he's learning that. Oh, and he's also learning programming, too, as well, because he has to program these machines as well. <laughs> so it's pretty amazing. Now, think about this. How many government school kids? He's 11. Right. So what is that? <laughs> sixth grade. How many sixth graders are doing electrical engineering okay, <laughs> or programming? So, yeah, it's pretty, pretty amazing stuff. Um, yeah. And then we uh, we do that for a couple of hours. And, yeah, they do their, their chess. I usually have them play each other. Um, yeah, and then we leave and I drive them to their classes usually, which is actually works out because the classes are geared to after school kids. So we have the whole like morning and afternoon to ourselves and then we drive to the classes um, and I drop them off. And then I also teach my chess classes, um, my group classes online. So I usually go and teach there. I go to my mother-in-law's place. She's close to there fencing places and gymnastics. So I go and teach my online classes there. Then I go pick them up. So. I, and, 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 you know, my, my schedule is very flexible, so it kind of really works for me. So that's kind of uh, a typical thing. We usually get home like um, 8, 9, if it's really late, 10 o'clock. <laughs> so we got a pretty packed day a, a lot of the time. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and also meeting up with other families if it's warmer, you know, outdoors, going to uh, – this is the other great thing, going to the woods. Get your kids outside mm -hmm. into the woods, right? And for those people who are like helicopter parents, it is a little bit scary to like let your kids loose with other kids going into the woods. But that's the beautiful thing. You know, the kids are with the other kids having a great time. It's like, I'll tell you what, if you if you buy your kid, you know, a game, a video game or an iPad and they have like little apps on their games, they may play that for a little bit and get bored. They will never get bored in the woods. Right. Kids always find something to do and are always having an amazing time with other kids in the woods. And yeah, so you <laughs> it's know, awesome. what, what's um, what's clear to me from this discussion is you are an involved, active, dedicated, concerned parent who is doing what you think is best to educate your kids. Now, other people, maybe people even listening to this podcast might say things like, well, I don't approve of how you are educating your kids. <laughs> so, right, because that's the objection here, if there's an objection here. Uh -huh. some, some parents and some people who aren't parents, but just some people in the world might decide they don't like how you are educating your kids. So I'm thinking about this in the context of live and let live right. and in the context of, as you very aptly said, the golden rule at the beginning means exactly the same thing. Right? Let's talk about the golden rule for a minute. Uh, would you like people aggressing against you? I wouldn't. I don't want to be hit over the head. I don't want anybody, you know, using, uh, engaging in fraud or coercion against me or doing things that put me at big risks of harm. Well, if you don't want like that, then don't treat other people that way, right? So what is it we're talking about here? We're talking about a parent who has what lawyers would call a fiduciary responsibility, right? An important responsibility that you undertook when you decided to have kids. And you are discharging that in a way that you think is best to raise your kids. Why is there so much controversy here, right? I mean, other people are saying, we, right. even if they say, right, to pl I could play the parent who doesn't approve of how you're raising your kids, right? Well, I don't, I don't like how you're raising your kids. I don't like how you're educating your kids. I think you should do it differently. Who should make this decision? 
That's really the mm-hmm. question we're talking about here with live and let live. Should you make the decision or should some other parent or the government or group of parents, who gets to decide how you raise your kids? Now, to be fair about it, the question isn't quite that simple, right? Because you're obviously a responsible parent who's doing things that rational arguments can be made to this connects to educating your kids. But what about the parent who's really being dereliction of duty, right? The parent who says, I'm not sending my kids to any school. I don't think they need any school. I just want them to go play in the woods all day. What are, what are your reactions to that? Should anything be done with such a parent? And what should the law be in this regard? Yeah, I think I think that is one uh, conclusion that a lot of um, a lot of uh, parents that don't understand what, what you know, unschooling and homeschooling is, uh, they come to that conclusion that, oh, you're just hands off. So you don't you don't involve yourself at all with the kids like you just let them do whatever they want. <laughs> um, I mean, no, I don't. <laughs> I definitely don't do that. So, I mean, I wouldn't call what we do complete unschooling because we do have that, you know, kind of structure of like, you know, we do the morning stuff and then we do the classes at the end of the day, you know, towards the end of the day. So it's not complete. Um, you know, I was going to say anarchy, but <laughs> that's, that's not a good description either. Um, but yeah, so we, we do we do have some structure. But uh, but yeah, I mean, at the same time, allowing the kids to freedom to play outside or go into the woods is so valuable, so valuable for kids to actually, you know, it's like when, when a parent is over their child constantly, you know, just watching them, like some parents that, that join my, uh, you know, our forest play group um, and, you know, they're un, they're they're unfamiliar with that idea of just letting the kids run. Like I see they're so nervous. They look, they, they say, I can't see my kid. I can't see my kid. Where's my kid? <laughs> and, and then the joke is I never know where my kid is. That's the that's the running joke in our group. And I always look to one of the other mothers, where's my kids? <laughs> but but that's the thing, is like I think when you are with your kids constantly and you don't outsource the parent parenting responsibility to either a daycare or a kindergarten or or an elementary school uh you get i think you 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 gain a trust with your child that you trust them and they trust you and and so yeah they can go off and i really don't think that anything would be wrong with them and another thing that's very interesting is that i noticed uh with my kids anyway uh is that a lot of kids that um that go to government school. Another unwritten rule is um, is you are a subject, right? You are inferior, and then there's a superior. You must be quiet unless you are called on or spoken to, right? You must ask permission for everything from your superior, right? There is an immediate power differential relationship, right? It's not an equal peer-to-peer relationship, definite power differential. Right. And so they understand that adults, for the most part, are superior to them and they must act deferentially. Right. Um, And so with my kids, because we don't um, we don't have that that situation, that relationship. And so I think as a result, they approach uh, other adults in a similar way. Right. They don't act necessarily like they are inferiors when they are around other adults. They talk to other adults. Right. My daughter, I remember when she was she's like nine right now, but I remember when she was like four or five. Yeah, maybe four. I remember going and we would be walking and she'd be passing by people. Hi, hi. <laughs> like she's no problem talking to people. And and that's and I find that to be pretty amazing. Um, and the other the other interesting idea or the interesting effect of it, I've noticed is a lot of parents have come up to me and they say, wow, your kids are very relaxed and they're very independent. Right. So like so many people, you know, when you say I'm going to bring my kids to this, is it OK if I bring my kids? And they say, how old are your kids? And I say, let's say that let's say they're like, you know, seven and nine. Right. My kids were seven and nine at the time. And they're like, oh, no, I don't know if they can do it because, it's, you know, it's isn't for an adult. But but for the most part, when I bring my kids to places with adults, they are amazed at how mature they act around other adults. Right. Uh, I'll give you an example. I was at a Christmas party for my chess employer in Manhattan. And uh, yeah, and there was a bunch of adults there. And I asked him, can I bring my kids? And he was like, eh, a little bit. But but I, he knew that my kids helped me in my chess classes. So they came and he actually um, he actually praised me afterwards. He was like, wow, I was amazed at how your kids were acting in that environment of all adults. There, there were like no kids there. 
But, so it sounds <laughs> well. Well, just real quick, Danilo, I think I want to try to bring you back around to Mark's question because I think it's a really important question, and I think the answer to it, or getting a solid answer to it, could help to address maybe some concerns of people to a radically different education system. What Mark was kind of talking about was, well, what do we do about dereliction of duty? What safeguards do we have? Let me let me try to pinpoint are you, are you, the issue. Are you talking about? Are you talking about the idea of CPS? Well, let me like try to if, pinpoint the issue with an example that we had in our home state of Arizona. Uh, there was a group, a collective group of families. Um, it wasn't a whole bunch of people, but it was a sizable enough amount. And they basically, it, to, to be unflattering to them intentionally, it was basically a cult-like situation where they mm. had complete control of the um, worldviews of their kids. They took uh, steps to cut their children off from Internet and things like the the web and the news channels and everything like that and they uh, they raised their children in in a homeschooling type environment where they taught them things that uh, su- such as well it's okay for 12 year olds to have sex with 40 year olds and it's okay to have uh, for mm-hmm. adults to have multiple uh, children brides and things like mm-hmm. that and this is what they were taught and obviously we would say that this is probably a violation of the live and let live principle and um, this might be a concern of people like okay so you're not going to follow a curriculum set by the government how do we how do we make sure that you are doing your fiduciary duty to these children Um, and and what what can we do to intervene do you have any thoughts on this subject so number one I would say freedom is messy (laughs) in the sense that when we, you know, as anarchists, as we are, and voluntists that we are, we we are saying that we want the same freedom for ourselves to live as we want and raise our kids as we want. We would like our neighbors to be afforded the same freedom, right, and their families, right. And so, in a certain sense, I would say that we we really don't have um, an assurance. There is no assurance that um, you know. That everyone's going to be, you know, raising their kids, you know, well, or maybe let's say the way we would think would be the best entrepreneurs that minded maybe uh, or with a firm base in morality. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, it is a it is a sticky situation. I'm not going to I'm not going to shy away from it. And, and as lawyers, you know, you guys probably um, can understand how to navigate that uh, much more than I can. Yeah, well, um, let me give you an assurance. I have an assurance yeah, yeah. that I can give you. I can assure yeah. you there will be parents who act exactly the way that Andy just described. We know this, right? right? I mean, it's right. easy to say as right. freedom guys, look, uh, good parents should uh, be able to decide what they think is most important for their kids to learn and create that environment and do the kinds of things that uh, they think are best to educate their kids. That's all great. But what do we do with the kind of nuts? I'll, I'll say nuts, right? <laughs> Um, just to sort of summarize it, right? Uh, okay. or, or people who engage in nutty behavior is a, is a better way to say it, who are going to take their kids and teach them about the earth is flat and that science is all wrong or whatever, just crazy or, or you know, hateful things or whatever. They, they're teaching them things that are, uh, we might conclude, violating their duty to act as in the interest of the kids. What do we do see, with these see, people? See, on your, on your subject, and it makes me think of the faith healing prosecutions, right? There have been many times mm. in, in yeah. our country's mm. history where right. uh, the, the parents, because of strong, maybe even good faith, religious convictions forewent conventional medicine, and it maybe cost their children their lives or severely endangered them, at least according to popular science. How do we deal with these problems? Yeah, 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 that's a really good point. Um... You know, again, I think I, I always fall back on the idea that that the same freedom that we that we afford ourselves, that we would like everyone else to be afford the same freedom. Now, um, for the for the for the kids that have, uh, let's say, let's say faith healing. Um, I mean, you know, we can talk to the parents, we can educate them, we can we can form groups, you know, we can try to raise awareness, that kind of thing. But I mean, I mean, what's the line between, you know, does this constitute aggression or, you know, I'm sure there's a blurry area as well. Right. But let's I mean, say it's not so anarchists- blurry. Let's say it's not so blurry. You raise all those things and they say, mind your own business. Uh, we do what we want to do over here. We're not listening to anything that you have to say. Uh, we're faith healers. We're not giving our kids 
Um, any uh, vaccinations, any medicines, any pills, nothing drug, like that. Any kind of drug to cure any kind of condition that could be really serious but could be easily cured. We're going to teach mm-hmm. them all kinds of wacky things about the world. I mean, I guess what we're saying is, is there some point that ever mm-hmm. arrives where we can say, as freedom people, sorry, mm-hmm. uh, you are in dereliction of your duty as a parent, and we're going to start taking some action up to and including severing your parental rights. Do we ever get there? And how do so, we get so, there? So if you're asking me um, if I encountered such a situation, would I feel justified in, let's say, contacting CPS? I assume is that is that kind of what, like, what would I do? What would I do if I found out there was a family that was raising their kids this way, right? Should we have a CPS? Yeah, what that's your- a good question. That's, and actually, interestingly enough, I actually interviewed the guy, um, Carlos Morales. Have you, do you, do you know him? He was a, he's a CPS whistleblower. Uh, I don't a couple know. Of years ago, I don't know. Carlos, and he, and no. he, uh, he, I think he's based out of Texas, and he, um, he used to work in CPS, and uh, he really, and he's also anarchist, and 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 he has his own channel and everything. But he exposed a lot of the underbelly of the CPS. Amazing, amazing stuff. You know, increased incidents of you know molestation, of rape, of just depression, suicide. You know, okay, well, these kids that are removed let's from their agree, homes. But, let's agree the government has done a bad job at running CPS. Right, but do we right. need is that a function we need? Do we need a privatized yes, think, CPS? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So so basically if you're asking me, you know, would I ever feel justified in contacting CPS? I would say no. I would never feel justified. But I I would if I knew of a parent uh, if a family that was raising their kids, sure, I would approach them. I would talk to them. I would take matters into my own hands. You know, it's like the state, you know, in essence, to me, is outsourcing of responsibility. Right. So if you have a problem with your neighbor because the, the, you know, they're having a big party or the, the whatever is too loud, you can call the police and you can get them involved and and probably involve a lot of violence in the situation or. Why don't you just go to your neighbor's house and talk to your neighbor, right? So I will never, as an anarchist, as a principled anarchist and volunteers, I will never involve the state in, uh, in my affairs. Like, I, I don't ever feel justified in doing that. I, will, I can call friends. I can contact my network of people. Um, but I, I don't feel justified. Now, again, again, uh, you, know, you know a family that's doing something you know, unethical. You, know, you do what you can, but... As a principled anarchist, I would never feel justified in contacting the state. So I, I hope does that answer your question? Well, I don't know that we want to bring the state in because that complicates matters, right? Now we're talking yeah. about how are they oh, funded yeah. and things like that. But oh, yeah. <laughs> but couldn't you couldn't yeah. you hire someone who's your agent to go defend the rights of this minor who is being mistreated? Maybe they're not receiving proper food or medication and or horrible education or something. I mean, doesn't there come at some point at which either you or your agent can barge over to the house, open the door, knock on the door and say, hey, we, you're not treating your kid properly. And they say, go away. It's my kid. Leave me alone. Well, we can still push the door open. Come on in, grab the kid and take the kid to safety. Does there ever come a time where I, that's justified? Yeah, I mean, I mean, OK, so the in the in the voluntarist uh, framework and the and the free market framework where there is no you know let's say no state police and no anything sure that might be justified but i think if, if we tried to do it now you might be charged with like breaking and entering you know into someone's home <laughs> so you couldn't do that but you know i i, I mean this sounds like a very hypothetical situation right but uh but yeah so but in other um, words you agree that there's a reasonable range in terms of how parents interact with their kids not just in mm. terms of education but also in terms of health care and uh, nutrition and all these other things you, you agree that parental discretion is not absolute yeah i guess i guess you are right yeah there are there are moments but but actually you know what if you do go along the path of of uh you know you see a family that um is uh, aggressing against their child let's say physically let's say like spanking corporal punishment that is physical aggression right but what would i feel justified in barging into their house to prevent that you know i don't know i mean i mean what's what's the level of the spanking is it like pulling the hair pulling the ear you know like 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 are they are they leaving bruises like 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 there's li- different you know but there's certainly a point like a, at which you would feel comfortable doing that i can assure you there's a point that sure uh, i would barge sure. right in the front door and punch the dad in the face and grab the kid and leave i mean there's a point at which that's yeah. the that's the proper thing to do under yeah. any construction of a free society i would think all right what are your thoughts yeah. on that yeah yeah so i mean i mean it is a justifiable concern for a lot of parents you know when you when you talk about the idea of homeschooling and schooling you know people possibly abusing their kids but i would say at the same time 
that I believe most parents um, do not raise their kids that way. I believe most parents do treat their kids well, do feed them, do give them adequate, you know, you know, medical care, nutrition, shelter, housing, you know, all like clothing, right? So I think for the most part, those are uh, the rare exceptions. They uh, are rather than There's no. Question, we agree with that, know? but so uh, so yeah. So but they exist. They, they exist, right? Right. No, no. no. Yeah, you're right. And I mean, I mean, to me, it's the same. Um, it's the same concern when I talk about anarchism and, and the illegitimacy of the state. And then people say, well, what are you going to do when, you know, there's no police and, you know, someone sticks you Who's up in, in favor the, of no police in, is, uh, is well, some, well, I'm saying, well, I'm saying no, no state police will say the state police, uh, you know, you can have private security. And everything. I'm saying because like, this, this is what they think. So so people always point out the outliers. They always point out there's evil people. There's murderers, there's rapists, there's burglars, there's thieves, right? And so for that reason, we need the state. We need, and whatever capacity is, state police or or military. And and we, there are sociopaths in the world. And I would say, yes, you're right. There are sociopaths in the world. But for the most part, most people do understand basic morality. If you stop a person on the street and you ask them, is it is it justified for you to use violence to solve your daily problems, I think most people would understand that as no, that's not justified, right? I've never met a person that said yes. <laughs> yeah, we're in complete agreement with you on this yeah. one. I think what we're trying to get at is what do we do for those outliers? What do we do for the sociopaths? Is there a place? Do we simply, as as freedom activists, do we, is really the solution here that there's no solution? We have to throw up our hands and say, well, if they want to rape their eight year old, uh, it's you know, parents have unfettered discretion. There's no point at which we can you know in any way, shape, or form intervene. Or if there is a point, what is it, and what are the mechanisms that we intervene? And who decides what that point is? Right. I think everybody does. I think. I think. I think when people and you know when people um, disabuse the idea of the state in their mind, the legitimacy that we need a state to have a civilized society. I think immediately what happens is people acquire a responsibility mindset where they say, you know what, I can't outsource. Um, security and protection to a police. I I, I must um, acquire more responsibility in protecting myself, or maybe form a network of people where we protect them. Maybe we have a private security, you know, watch or community watch or things like that. So people all of a sudden become more uh, responsible for themselves and the welfare of their families, right? So just I think when people immediately begin to think like that, um, instances like this. Uh, decrease drastically, right? And so at the same time as they de decrease drastically, also people say, if I see something that I consider to be uh, wrong or immoral, I will take action, right? So immediately people will have the mindset once they remove the, the legitimacy of the state in their mind. Danilo, we're towards the end of our time, but I really wanted to ask you about something because it kept coming into my mind as you were describing your methods of homeschooling, unschooling, and describing what sounds like this really excellent uh, situation that you've set up for your children to allow them to be free to learn and express themselves and explore so many different great uh, extracurriculars that you described. It sounds like your your children are, are have a very very good upbringing from what I've heard, and, and thank you. It sounds like something that parents should aspire yeah, to. Thanks for being a great dad. But man. but but throughout all that, <laughs> it kept popping up into my mind. This sounds like a huge transaction cost for this guy. It sounds like he's got to change his life and change his world and change his schedule. And uh, I couldn't help but thinking, geez, I couldn't do that with children. If I I don't have children, but when I do someday, I was like, I'm a lawyer. Like I'm very very busy. You know, there might be mm, doctors. Right and engineers and people your your son presumably is going to get hired as a big fancy engineer someday if he keeps <laughs> on this track and he's going to have a very busy schedule and it takes a huge amount of resources uh, for for this type of an upbringing, this type of a schooling. And no doubt, I mean, obviously, then the question becomes, okay, well, then do we just give this to somebody else? Do I hire an agent to serve in my place? But then I think, too, there's undoubtedly value that it's you who's doing this, that it's the mm. actual parent who's doing this. What do you have to say to people who might say, ah, I just don't have the resources or time to do this type of a, a schooling? Well, first of all, let me just clarify one thing. It's not just me. It's my wife, too. If I just say it's me, she'll get mad at me. <laughs> I can't think of all Give the credit. Give credit where credit's due. 
the first thing that parents need to need to understand if they want to pursue this lifestyle is one parent does have to stay home. One parent does have to not work full time. I mean, I work, let's say you can just say the equivalent of a part time job with my chess classes and everything is pretty flexible. But yeah, uh, resources are limited for that reason. And so and yet the other thing is it's like it's like. Um, uh, I guess I guess we do spend a lot more money than let's say we send it to government school because that's all paid for by taxes already. Um, but but yeah, it is it is quite expensive, you know. And we do, you know. The, you know I remember Stefan Malio was following him a while ago, and he says that children are resource vampires. Hmm. <laughs> it's so true. So <laughs> many resources going to you know, and and you know, so many kids, so many people have kids, right? It's not easy. It's not an achievement. It's kind of funny, you know. I I don't like this idea of Father's Day or Mother's Day. It's not an achievement to have kids. Right. You everybody is for the most part born fertile. <laughs> so for for Father's Day or Mother's Day to be celebrated, that's not an achievement. Right. It's not not the achievement to be a parent, but to raise your kids uh, in a way where they will become successful and thrive. That is an achievement. Right. And that is our goal. So, you know, we you know, and, and, and I think most parents, their goal is for their child to be self-sufficient. Right. Independent, you know. Uh, can support themselves. That is their goal. And so again, at the same time, that's why we're, we're, we're really pushing for entrepreneurship and they understand capitalism and free markets and the value of business, right? The idea of, of uh, you know, marketing, selling yourself, creating value in the marketplace so that, so that people want to patronize you, you know, or, or you have to figure out what problems people have and then you figure out a solution, Right. And that's how you create a successful business. So that's what we're teaching them. So, yeah, it is it is very resource uh, driven and uh, does require a lot of, of dedication and effort by the parents. But, you know, if you don't have children to raise them yourselves, in my mind, I don't know why a person would be having children. Like, why would I want to give my child to the state to raise for myself? No, I wouldn't. You know, one of my favorite Malcolm X quotes is, um, um, uh, what don't give uh, your child um, to be taught by the enemy, basically. <laughs> In my mind, it's, it's equivalent to sending your kids to government school, which talking about child abuse, I do consider sending your kids to government school to be equivalent to child abuse. Um, what, but so what that, you're <laughs> saying right now has an implication, right? What you're saying is, is if you chose a career path or work a job where you're not going to have the resources to homeschool or raise your own child, you shouldn't be having children. It's child abuse. Is it? Would you stand by that position? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would. I would say that as well. Yeah, yeah. It's a radical position. Is, a, is an enormous responsibility. Enormous, and 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 it's just taken for granted so much. Um, and so, yeah, people really have to think hard. Uh, you know, having kids, it's not an achievement. People can have five, six, seven kids, but how are you going to raise them? What are you going to do? Do you have the resources to really give them a great start in life? You know, that that's the real question. Uh, and I think people, a lot of people have to think long and hard, you know, before they choose to have children. Well, so. there's so much to unpack and there all of is. that. We need many more hours. To yeah. Go and this. it's also kind of interesting that we focused in on like a laser on this one aspect of your many, many, many uh, interesting areas that you focused on. But uh, that just means we'll have to have you back again sure. to explore. Some, maybe we'll have a, a chess strategy episode or uh, learn, uh, are, learn are about you both chess class. players. I'm not, but I am actually a uh, piano player, so that part Ooh, of your resume is excellent. Excellent. And what about you, Mark? Are you, are you a chess player? Well, I have played chess in my uh, in my life, and I and I like to point out that my wife has never ever beaten me in chess. <laughs> um, <laughs> But she's not here, and if she was here, she would point out we've only played once. And then I, <laughs> so so I, you know, I kind of retired after that. I wanted to retire the Go champion. Out on top, man, yeah, I wanted yeah. to retire the champion. Retire so so at the moment, I'm the champion in the family, the chess Excellent. champion. Excellent. Mm. Yeah. Excellent. So real real quick before we go, I'll just say this: uh, I have a running deal with my kids. Uh, if they beat me in in a game of chess, I will pay them fifty dollars. So so far, my daughter, she beat me twice uh two years ago so i have a i had a picture on facebook of of her holding a hundred dollars nice right? and i <laughs> i paid her. i love I that positive reinforcement this, right? to how oh yeah how old's your daughter thing. Uh, well, well, now she's nine, but that was when she was like six. Wow, she beat me. <laughs> you know, I you weren't taking it easy on her, were you? No, I was. Oh, that's the other question. A lot of people ask. You must have taken it easy. No, I wasn't. Wow. I actually committed one of the of the greatest mistakes that beginners do which is when they are ahead they have a lot of material advantage in their opponent then they kind of relax and they don't um they don't 
think their their opponent is a threat anymore. And that was my mistake. And so she quickly checked me into my king because I wasn't paying attention. This is a <laughs> this is a psychological thing that happens across the board in sports is that you get a yeah. that comfortable lead and it's a dangerous Right, lead. right. Exactly. So uh she was so happy, you know, ear to ear smile. She, you know, <laughs> we took pictures. So a yeah. six year old can buy a whole lot of six year old stuff with a hundred bucks. I'm sure she was thrilled. You know, I'm left thinking I I don't know that I personally would agree with every aspect of how he's raising his kids, but I got to say, man, if we could increase the percentage of dads in the world who are this dedicated to raising their kids, and you know, that we disagree, who cares? Yeah. That we disagree, it's his kids. He gets to make those decisions. I think that's the bigger point here. I think the second point is to a point, right? And it's at some point, he doesn't get to make those decisions anymore. And that's where we need, that's where the rubber hits the road. And maybe mm. the next time we talk, we can explore that issue a little bit more. At some point, you don't get to make the decisions, right? At the point you're um, using corporal punishment in an excessive kind of a way, you're depriving mm. of food and healthcare mm. and things like that. At some point, somebody's got to come in and say, sorry, you don't get to do this anymore. And we got to define a range of reasonableness and a, and a range of unreasonableness. And I think that'd be a good discussion for the next time. But man, I, uh, I, I couldn't be more impressed with your dedication to being a dad. And, and I've said it on many occasions. If there was one thing we could snap our fingers and improve that could really dramatically improve the world, Better parents. Yes. Better parents. Mm, completely agree. Yeah, so cheers to you, brother, for being a good dad. Danio, do us awesome. a, do our so listeners a favor and plug your podcast and website real quick. Yeah, so my website is peacefulanarchism.com. Uh, uh, YouTube channel, Peaceful Anarchism. Uh, podcast also. I'm on like Stitcher, iTunes. I'm like pretty much, I think, any podcatcher app that you can get. Um, uh, lately I haven't been posting that much because I've been focused so much on my chess courses. I, I that's pretty much all I post about, uh, <laughs> primarily because my wife's like, you know, you got to make more money. So like, you know, the, the, the podcast doesn't really make that much. So, so, um, uh, you know, the chess course is a little bit more lucrative. Um, but, um, you know, I, I'm having fun with that too. It's, it's really a, it's a great, great thing. I interact with a lot of kids, a lot of adults. Uh, that are coming back into chess after like years and years of not playing. And uh, so, I, yeah, I derive a lot of enjoyment. Maybe I'll that. have you coach me if I decide to come out of retirement someday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Rematch your wife and uh, I'm sure you will. I don't know. She's, she's, she's much smarter than I am. So I, don't want, I really don't want to play her again. <laughs> <laughs> Big thanks to Danio. Everybody should go check out all of his uh, his website, his podcast, and uh, also go check out liveandletlive.org for this podcast and many more. See what we're up to. We've got a lot of big things in the works, chapters popping up all over the planet, all over the planet Earth, and we hear about wow. new ones every day. So um, this has been attorney Andy Markintel and attorney Mark J. Victor. Until next time, we're the Peace Radicals. Peace! Peace.